All right. Hey, good afternoon. <laughs> Here we are once once again. Wow, we're coming up on the end really quick. And uh, wow, I uh, hope you're ready or will be ready. My best of luck on your final. Uh, today, uh, I, I'm not going to do, uh, uh, I, I don't do a review for the entire semester. Uh, I'm just going to uh, concentrate on chapter 13 and 14 since you're going to get that new stuff that you're going to get on the exam or uh, potential for the exam. And uh, if uh, we've got all the past reviews online, if you want to see them, uh, you're going to be kind of uh, having other finals and trying to budget your time is going to be a problem. Um, usually the best bet is to go over your midterms, make sure you understand those. Also all the practice problems we've dealt with uh, here and you know on these reviews uh, have been from Dr. Young. So they're his questions. And so those are probably your best bet as far as studying uh, to, you know, what's going to be on there. Beyond that, you probably don't have the time to go back over all the homework and all that stuff. So uh, again, just kind of strategize on that. So we'll uh, take a look at chapter 13 and 14. There might be a little noise over here. I'm going to shut this. Okay. Chapter uh, 13, we're going to be uh, dealing with universal gravitation. Uh, we're not explaining what gravity is. We're just giving some relationships that we know about, about gravity to make some predictions. Uh, the idea that you have a couple masses, uh, any kind of mass is always going to be attracting gravitationally. Uh, the, the, uh, there's whatever force is on one is equal and opposite the force on the other. So this is Newton's third law. That's going to hold. Uh, the idea that the force is the inverse square law, this comes from Newton. He's the guy that kind of first guessed the, this is the answer. First he guessed it, he also had to uh, develop uh, integral calculus in order to follow all, all of the implications. Uh, we'll look at a bit of that. Um, this force constant at 10 to the minus 11th, this is pretty small up here. So normally we don't notice these things on an everyday level. Uh, where there's, you know, attraction between things. Uh, this force constant, I think Dr. Young maybe kind of gave you a little argument how we can actually measure this in the lab with real masses. Uh, we have this kind of set up here. We, it, it takes a while to set it up, so we usually don't do it in the class. But he, he had the, I'm sure he's, he likes these lead balls to really emphasize the idea that there's a force between them. And you can get uh, forces between things here and a little fiber that torques around. And we can actually measure these really small forces and explore this universal gravitation in right in the lab um, this idea that this force this relationship consider that it's just really giving you the magnitude of the force between these two two things uh, don't consider it a vector as yet uh, even though it that force is a vector this one's pointing in one direction this points in the other direction you want to relate it to you know the particular problem we have let's say we've got three masses here these are forces they can be broken into components uh, and it's really when we start to set it up here where we uh, give a sign convention whether it's in the plus direction uh, or in the minus direction we can put that in um, and which one we're talking about am I focused on this one the force is pointing in that direction if I'm focused on that one the force is pointing in the other direction so it's really in the context that we use these things that determines which way we're gonna point those vectors um, okay let's uh, deal with uh, more universal gravitation the idea of something large like the gravity we feel here on earth uh, we feel you know a particular force of gravity uh, the idea that this inverse square law let me back up this this other slide here uh, is really this r is the center to center distance but now this is really strictly only true for a spherical distribution of mass if it's got a more complicated shape it's going to be more complicated we're going to have to integrate it over over the volume and in fact if uh, 
Newton kind of guessed the answer on this, and, but he had to, it took him 19 years till he was able, actually able to prove it. Uh, the idea that, let's say, this is uh, Newton's apple here, near the surface of the Earth, it's being attracted by all the bits of matter on, on the Earth. Uh, you've got some here that are very close to this. They can't, you know, a, one up here is going to be pulling in this direction a little bit, up that way. Or down here, it's going to be pulling in, in, in this direction. Over here, they're going to also be pulling on this thing. However, they're further away than the, with the center. And so these are more distant, and these are more close. And it turns out if you actually do the calculus and integrate over this thing, uh, it will turn out that the results are the same as if we took the whole Earth and squished it down to a single point. And this would be the mass of the Earth. And then we'd have, let's say, the apple mass M over here. And there's this pole. So we can use the gravitational force law, the mass of the whole Earth times a small m of the mass of the apple. Uh, over that is the gravitational force. And we know that force is equal to ma. And for gravity, when we drop something, this is one of the things we, first things we did is drop something and we got the acceleration due to gravity. That was 9.8. So if we go ahead and set the, the gravitational force equal to ma, where a is what we call g, 9.8, uh, we can the m's uh, can cancel and we can solve for g, the acceleration due to gravity. And we can stick in the numbers here and come up with uh, 9.8. Um, usually, uh, this is done the other way around. Uh, how do we know the mass of the Earth in the first place? Well, actually, we're just working this problem backwards. Imagine I needed to find the mass of the Earth, and I know what g is. It's got to be 9.8. Uh, so I could go ahead and then solve for the mass of the Earth. And this is what you would get to, really working backwards to getting the mass. And so that would be then the mass of the Earth. It would have to be. OK. Um, now, uh, sometimes we're we're at some distance away from the surface of the Earth. Let's say we go up. Oh, and watch the language in the problems here. They'll talk about something like altitude. Uh, that's measured from the Earth's surface up. But when we're dealing with the gravitational law, that's really center to center. So that's the center of the Earth pulling on the very center of some object that's up here that we were maybe going to drop. So the idea that up here, if we take something up here, no matter how far we get away, if we just let go of it, it's going to start to fall back to the Earth. Now, it's not going to start off with a 9.8 falling uh, towards the Earth. As it's further out, it's going to be, the force is going to be weaker, and the gravitational force would be follow the same kind of reasoning, but the distance is going to be the radius of the Earth plus that altitude. So watch, watch that word with the altitude. That's this distance. And if we're dealing with the center to center distance, it's, from, well, from center to center. Um, OK, so uh, anyway, oh, I wanted to point out, I call this g prime up here. That would be the acceleration as it would first start to fall. And of course, it depends on the position, how tall your altitude is. The bigger the altitude, the further you get away from the Earth, uh, this is going to become smaller. And that's going to be that acceleration. So if I just take something out in space here and just drop it, it's going to fall to the Earth no matter how far I am away. Uh, but, of course, the further I am away, the, uh, the weaker the gravity, and so it's going to start falling, but sl following slower. Uh, I mean, follow, it's, uh, it's going to fall slowly at first, and it's going to pick up speed as it goes in. And the acceleration is not going to be constant. It's going to be increasing as we go in. Um, okay. Okay, now... Often what we'll do with uh, gravitation, we'll put something into uh, the simplest case is a circular orbit. 
where we're going to, uh, if I have some mass out here and I want to get it to orbit, if I just leave it on its own and just drop it, it's going to fall in. If I give it a push and send it off with some velocity, that is just the right velocity, this is going to actually send this thing into orbit. Uh, in a sense, it's, uh, it, it will be uh, this idea of a circular orbit. If we do this velocity, we don't give it too much velocity, we give a little, it's going to end up curving and falling into the earth, maybe get a little farther. If this velocity is greater than this, it would actually fly off of this and would go out in a larger elliptical orbit or even a hyperbolic or parabolic orbit if we go fast enough. But let's uh, focus on a circular orbit. <coughs> um, good old F equals MA is still with us. The uh, force is this new gravitational law, inverse square law, and it's equal to the mass, and the acceleration for a circular orbit is going to be V squared over R. Uh, if we go ahead and solve this, you'll notice that this mass, as often happens here, is going to end up canceling. So I don't know the mass of this satellite. I don't need to know it. I do need to know this large mass of the Earth or whatever planet we're dealing with. Uh, and if I take this, canceling the M's, I can cancel one of the R's, take the square root, and I have the velocity. This would be the velocity that's necessary to take this thing into a circular orbit. Okay, now if we play with, you know, distance is equal to velocity times time. Uh, for this picture, we're going to be going around in a circular orbit. This velocity would remain the same, so it's a constant velocity around there. Constant in terms of speed, I should say. Obviously, its direction is going to be changing. But in terms of its speed, it, that would be its speed. Uh, we can say that as you go around this thing, the distance around this circle would be 2 pi r. Uh, the velocity would be, as we just found here, square root of gm sub e over, over r. And then t, this, I'm giving it a capital T, capital T. This represents the period of this orbit. And uh, so this would be the straightforward extension of that. Now, uh, we can do a little algebra on this thing. You know, with the square root, let's just go ahead and square the whole thing. So this 2 pi goes 4 pi squared. This becomes an r squared. We get rid of the radical there, leaving this. And of course, we're going to uh, square the time or the period. <clears throat> this r, we can take up with this, and we end up with three of them. Let's say we do a little <clears throat> algebra here. Uh, this r comes up here as an r cubed. We're left with a 4 pi squared. We're going to be uh, bring g and the mass of the earth down here. That's going to leave t squared alone. Uh, this is something that is called uh, Kepler's third law. That this relates the period of the orbit to the radius of that orbit. And uh, uh, sometimes said that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the of the radius and this is going to be that proportionality constant so you should be able to kind of derive these things as you can see from an example that I'm going to use that it's necessary to understand the thought process behind this don't just uh, start grabbing these equations they're a lot easier if you know where they come from uh, and uh, also easier to hang on to as far as your memory. Now, we, we're, we're doing some derivations for relatively simple problems, that, and that's strictly for circular orbits. Uh, you do have some homework uh, problems related to elliptical orbits, which are more general. I alluded that if this velocity uh, is uh, greater than this for a circular orbit, it's going to fly off into a larger elliptical orbit. Or even if it's less than that, it could fall into a smaller elliptical orbit. So again, the circular orbit is just a very special case that we're going to uh, use to kind of derive these relationships. Now the book uh, gives these things simply because uh, one, you've got to do them in homework problems, but uh, it, it, without proof, 
the book just asserts that if we're dealing with not a circular orbit, but we're going to deal with an elliptical orbit, it's almost exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the radius is not a simple circular radius, which is kind of obvious what that is. This is, uh, they call it A, which is the semi-major axis that for the elliptical orbit, Kepler came up with the idea that we have these two foci of the ellipse and that the planet is at one of them. I can't really say which one it is. Uh, it could be maybe this one. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, distance across this thing, A, is the semi-major axis. So this takes the role of uh, the actual radius of the orbit. And certainly with an elliptical orbit, it becomes a circle for special case. You bring the ellipses in, bring that in, and then that is just the radius of the circular orbit. So again, the derivation of this, this is where Newton had problems uh, uh, developing it with the calculus to actually work out all the details. Uh, Kepler did this based on just observation. He had no clue on the idea of gravity being behind these properties of an, of a, of an elliptical orbit. Uh, so I, uh, I <coughs> would focus primarily on the circular. You do have some homework problems that require that you use this. Uh, I'm thinking he likely on the final will not give you an elliptical problem. He'll primarily focus on the circular. Uh, okay, another thing with elliptical orbits, uh, this is Kepler's second law, the radius of the vector drawn from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. Uh, that's kind of old language. Uh, modern language, we'd say the angular momentum is conserved. And the idea behind that is pretty simple. Uh, is that the force of gravity is pulling in, let's say on the sun, it's pulling in this way, and uh, the radius out to this, if we're going to try to figure out what the torque is, think of like a, a wrench a wrench handle, uh, we've got a, uh, the R vector is this way. We really only get torque if we apply a force that's perpendicular to the handle. This force, as you see up there, is pointing in along this thing. So as long as the force points in here, it doesn't lead to a torque either way. We'd have to say the torque is zero. So this is uh, similar to what we dealt with uh, of like a hockey puck going around a desk, going around. Uh, it had its angular momentum is conserved because the force pulls in to the same point that the radius is at, or the origin. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not expressing this too well, but R times F times the sine of this would be 180 degrees has to be zero. And as long as the torque is zero, we can conclude Im immediately that the angular momentum is constant. And that's the idea that it's going to sweep out area, equal areas in equal time. Uh, as, the, as this thing goes around, it picks up speed here. It's traveling faster, so it's going to sweep out a particular area. Uh, when it's over closer, it's uh, going to sweep through, it's going to come through here faster and is going to sweep through uh, a, really the same area, but it would be through a greater distance around here, kind of bumbling along. Uh, not too much is going to be done with this. Again, for homework problems, the only kind of problems that he could give you that would be reasonable would be uh, Something, we had this kind of in, in the homework where we have some central body and you're going around it like this. Uh, the idea of the angular momentum, in fact, just, can, uh, just intuitively kind of look at this. As if you were to take something and throw it in the air, it goes up and it slows down and then it falls back. Consider that the most distant point in this orbit, it's going up and as it goes up, it's going to slow down. So it's going to be slower over here. And then it's going to tend to fall back in. And so it's going to be traveling even faster when it gets over here. So fast and then comes over here slow, whoops around again fast, slow, fast, slow. We can get a simple relationship with this idea of angular momentum. Uh, it has to be conserved, so whatever angular momentum I had here 
has to match that here. And it would be true for every point along here, but now we're going to get uh, difficulty with angles and distances. Uh, so we, he wouldn't give you that, and you haven't got a homework problem like that, although you've got one like this. Uh, the idea of the angular momentum at point one would be r times the momentum, mv, v at one, and over here, r2, m, v2, and the m's can drop out and we, we have a relationship between the velocity here compared to the velocity here. Uh, we do need to know what their radii are, but very often you have, a, you have one on the with the Halley's Comet that is going around in an elliptical orbit. We know how close it is when it gets in close. Uh, then it swings out. We'll know how far it is when we get away. We're going to be using the basic geometry of this to uh, figure out what's going on. Again, kind of overreaching here, I think, probably for your exam, what he might expect. Uh, these are, again, elliptical orbits. I'll mention them because they're uh, in, in your material that, and, and it's possible they could be asked, although like, unlikely. Um, let's go to a first problem here where we are dealing with a circular orbit. Um, we have uh, Io, a moon of Jupiter, has a period of revolution, okay, of 1.77 Earth days. It's in a circular orbit around Jupiter with an orbital radius of 420,000 kilometers. So it's a good, good radius. And uh, from this information, calculate the mass of Jupiter. So the idea is we can watch this. And this was uh, something, of course, Galileo did. He looked up at uh, Jupiter and he saw Io going around. It goes around pretty quickly, uh, almost uh, once every two days. Uh, goes around the, the Earth. So let's uh, take a look at this. And let's uh, back up a little bit. Rather than just look at some of the relationships I've got, let's take another look here uh, and just kind of cement these ideas in. Uh, gravity is pulling in on this. That gravity is big G times the mass of Jupiter, which I don't know. The mass of Io, I, I'm calling that small m. I don't know that either. Uh, I do know that uh, r squared, the radius was, uh, was this, okay? And really that's the force, and that should equal ma, mass times acceleration, uh, since that's the only force that's as acting. Uh, so mv squared over r for circular orbits. Uh, this r cancels with one of these. I can even cancel this m here. I don't need to know the mass of io. Uh, and I've got v squared. So then, uh, so we've got this. And this I had uh, just uh, a couple minutes ago, kind of derived it again. I, again, I encourage you to, as you look at this, kind of keep things in the uh, basic uh, the, 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 these basic ideas, keep them locked in and derive them. They don't take long and they help you to remember them. Uh, so rather than memorize this, learn how to quickly derive it so you're, you're not thrown. Uh, that would be the speed that Io is going around. And again, we play with this idea distance is velocity times time. Okay, so the distance is going to be the the, the uh, orbit here, that's going to be 2 pi r. It's going to be equal to the velocity, which uh, is this, times the time. The time is what we call, uh, for us, will be capital T, the period. And he gives us that as 1.77 days. We want to uh, change this to SI units so we can work with G. Uh, so we want 24 hours in a day and 3,600 uh, uh, seconds in an hour and so on and we can turn that 1.77 days into the time going around in seconds uh, and then we could plug that back in uh, okay so yeah basically just substituting all this stuff in again I, I'm gonna take and square everything get rid of that radical so this this becomes a 4 pi squared r squared t squared and we get rid of that radical. Uh, the small m's uh, dropped out. 
uh, we did that back here. That was gone. And uh, then if we want to solve for the mass of Jupiter, I just take everything over to the other side. The r is going to become an r cubed, 4 pi. Uh, you can see the, how the algebra works out. It's pretty uh, simple as long as you uh, have these basic ideas, you can string these ideas together and come up with these expressions. So this would be the mass of the Jupiter. Uh, we should, uh, have, we see the numbers here, when we stick them in, uh, this is big G, we can come up with the mass of Jupiter, and this is going to be 1.9 times 10 to the 27th kilograms would be the mass of Jupiter. So we don't have to go to uh, Jupiter to weigh it, we can do this. Galileo, could, uh, he didn't know what the radius was, but he certainly knew what the period of IL was. Okay. Okay, uh, just uh, this is a past exam question that uh, floored a lot of people. Uh, but it also it illustrates a lot how we want to take these basic ideas and uh, feed them together. Uh, let's kind of look at this as kind of a weird kind of problem, not too likely in the universe here, but if we've got some central sun or, uh, here and some smaller planets kind of that are going to be orbiting the sun, and all of these planets that are going to be arranged in a perfect uh, triangle here, okay, and they're, then they're going to be going around, they could be going in either direction, either, either like this or like that. Um, Okay, so, okay, but he says, hint, okay, repeat what we did in class for Kepler's third law, but include the addition of two, uh, additional two masses, uh, two masses, we want three masses, a certain, oh, Oh, however you say that, star system compro uh, composed oh, of three stars. I've been calling them planets. Okay, so we have a, a large central star and we've got three smaller stars that are orbiting this larger star. Um, they have a mass small m, they're moving in a circular orbit, uh, radius r about this central star of mass capital M. The stars orbit in the same direction or in position one-third of a revolution apart from one another. So if you think of that, a triangle here would be an e uh, equilateral triangle. So the angles would be 60 degrees. Uh, and he wants us to uh, show that the period of each of the three stars is given by this expression. So we can actually prove this. So let's uh, kind of go here with, uh, this is the large central star. We have these other stars that are over here will be arranged really in this equilateral triangle. So hopefully you can kind of see this. They're going to be going around, I've kind of got indicated I've got a velocity this way. So they're going to be, according to my look at this, we're going to be traveling and they're going to be orbiting in this fashion around this center star. And uh, R, we'll use capital R to be the radius from the small star to the large central star. And of course, that's going to be the same for all of them. And uh, there's going to, a little geometry here, there's going to be a, an attraction between these two, the smaller stars, in addition to an attraction to the central star. So we're going to need, uh, in, uh, this will be an R squared, we need to have another R squared that's in here. And that's going to be, I'm just calling that distance D across here. And just from the geometry, uh, I can take D and take it in half, D over 2, should be equal to R times the cosine of 30 degrees. That should be this distance. Uh, D is going to be twice that, so we take and multiply by 2. So it looks like this distance D is going to be root 3 times whatever the radius of that central star is, or in the radius of the orbit. Okay, um, we can't, <clears throat> now there's all kinds of forces happening here. Uh, there's attractions between the small star and the large star. 
Uh, there's also these, this force of attraction between these two smaller stars, and this one and this one. Um, so we've got all these things. We really want to focus on one of them. I'm kind of setting it up to focus on this one, although we could do any of those corners. Um, that we have these forces that are pulling in. We've got one F1, I'm calling the main force into the center. Then there's uh, F2 is going to be the attraction between this one and that star. And F3 is going to be the force of attraction between that star. And so we've got these uh, forces that are pulling towards the center. Now, to get the uh, sense of direction on this, uh, uh, consider that we're going to take these two forces and break them up into components. I'll take this one uh, times the cosine of 30 degrees. That would tell me the direction in this direction. Uh, cosine, I mean this force times the sine of 30 degrees would be this component. Uh, when I come back over to this one, the force is in this direction, but if I take uh, that force times the cosine of 30 degrees, that would give me the force uh, in towards the center. And then the tangential component would be that force times the sine of 30, which is going to be this. Now, this one sine of 30 is going to be back in this direction. This one's going to be in this direction. So those two components are going to end up canceling. So the tangential components uh, in that direction cancel. And now I'm just concerned with the component that components that are in the direction into the central star or using that kind of symmetry. Uh, in the centripetal direction into the center we've got these three I've got this is the main force due to the main star here okay that's just the inverse square law that's not a surprise uh, these other ones we would say that the magnitude of the f of the force big G uh, it will be small m squared since it's the force of attraction between these two smaller ones uh, we're back on this one. This was big M for the mass of the center, small m for this guy. Uh, this force uh, times the cosine of 30 degrees is going to be the component that's in the radial direction. Uh, so we're going to have that. We're going to actually, because of these two, we're going to have two of them. And then all of that, that should be the force that's acting on this thing. It should be equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration, since this uh, is, is going to be orbiting in a circular path. And uh, so we can replace the centripetal with v squared over r. Uh, we've got these other terms that we can start to cancel a few things. Uh, the cosine of 30 degrees is going to be root 3 over 2. That 2 can cancel with that. Uh, we're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we've got these small m's. This is going to cancel, that's going to cancel. There's two of them here. One is going to cancel, leaving a, a still a small m here. Uh, but then what we're going to want to do is uh, solve for the velocity. Okay, so I've got the kind of simplified look here as we've crunched these numbers down. Uh, let's And now if I solve for V, this is the re relation for it. Okay, so this looks different than what we saw when we were just dealing with a single uh, satellite orbiting. Uh, and that's we, uh, why I want to emphasize, hey, we've got to take these ideas. He's going to be probing you whether you have these ideas or not. Once I have <coughs> that velocity, uh, his question was prove Kepler's second law, third law uh, for this thing uh, uh, orbiting. So let's, let's do that. That has to do with the, the period. So again, I'm using this idea distance is equal to velocity times time. Uh, the distance around is going to be a 2 pi capital R. It's going to be the radius of that orbit. Uh, the velocity is going to be this gnarly expression. We'll have that. Uh, times the time, and the time would be what we would call the period. And he wants to come up with a relationship for that period. And so uh, doing a little math here, we have the 2 pi r, and we'll just take all of this stuff over to the other side. Uh, I've got a few little tricky things in here. I've got a 
2 pi r that's here, uh, 2 pi r, and then I have a, I have a 1 over the square root of r, which I'm going to take over to this side as the square root. Okay, so that's just taking that term out of the root, bringing it over to the other side. Then the rest of this, I'm going to, after taking that away, I can take this whole expression, divide by the square root of that. And now we're just about in position here. Uh, I can take this r, square it, and bring it inside. So we end up with a r cubed here on the inside of the radical. And uh, because an r squared would give us this, and then this is a single, uh, single r inside. Hopefully you can see that from the math. Take a look at it for, for a minute. And uh, then we're, we're left with this. Uh, we've got this, yeah, it was over 1 over the square uh, cube root of 3. That, that came back in. Where did that come in? That came out here. Cosine of 30 degrees was root 3 over 2. And so that's going to come in. So we need to match his exact expression since we're supposed to show that, show this relationship, and I've put it in the form that he has it in on the problem. Let me just back up. Ooh, uh, well, let me do a lot of backing up here. Okay, this is the expression that he wants us to prove. So you look at that, and then, again, these steps here that we're going to go through. And it would be a good idea to take and work this through and we get this expression. And that's what we're asked to prove. So I, I thought it, it's, it's, it was a bit difficult. It really killed a lot of people. Uh, but it really shows a lot. So if you can follow through on this, you're going to have a, a good understanding of what's going to be <laughs> kind of expected of you. Yeah, time to answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I noticed on the, the last uh, problem, which was just one planet, you set it up to force is equal to mass times acceleration. You solve for P, okay. and you solve for the period. And then you did that here as well. Would you, would you say that's a good... Yeah, you, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, kind of summarizing. What was kind of the big picture? Let's, let's, uh, oops, let's back up to this a bit. And where did I have the... Well, that was actually, we kind of did that pretty early on. Um, no, I want to do, I, I did this actually twice, and so I think it's worth kind of coming back to this idea. Yeah, this is where I kind of show Kepler's uh, third law. Just summarizing again, uh, F equals MA. The force is the gravitational force. That's the only force that's acting. It's equal to the mass, and the acceleration has to be v squared over r. So from that, we get what the velocity is. And then once I know that velocity, I know the distance around is just 2 pi r times that velocity. And the time going around one time is what we call t, the period, the, uh, that time for one orbit. And then we proceed to do this. So we really followed this pretty much the same. We had a very different looking expression with the three stars, but we still got that velocity. And uh, from this part of it, that part's virtually identical. The only thing that varied was that velocity. Okay? Uh, let's see, I kind of jumped pretty far back there. Let me see if I can get us caught up here. Yeah, good point. And, yeah, feel free to interrupt if, uh, oh, we haven't gotten to, oh, okay, so, yeah, okay, so this is where we left off. Let me go ahead and run the current slide. So, again, coming here, and I've got to flip through a bunch of things anyway here. So, yeah, the idea we had that force was complicated because of all of these forces that are acting. We had to, we did get the component that's in towards the center. That's the only way we're going to have uh, a circular orbit is to have it directly into the center. Uh, v squared over R has got to be the acceleration. Uh, and then we can do the math and get the velocity. This was different. The other one didn't have that involved. This was added. And then, but then the next part is really distance is equal to velocity times time. 
2 pi r times that velocity times the time of the period. And then we had to do a little bit of manipulation to get it in the form that he was presenting it. And, but we did get his answer. Okay, let's now look at energy principles. Uh, uh, what we've done up to now is primarily forces and just like we did with mechanics that we have, uh, we have Newtonian methods where we deal with the forces we can also deal with problems with energy and if you're able to do uh, problems with energy you're going to uh, pro it's probably going to be easier than if we try to do it any other way so let's uh, just review kind of where we're at here. Up till now, we've dealt with primarily uh, good old flat Earth, that it's flat. We have something, uh, our potential energy, if we've got some mass here, and we want to lift it up to some height, we say we're going to do work on it to lift it. Once it has that energy, we call that the potential energy. We can release it and it can drop back. Um, if we want to lift this thing up, uh, we need an external force, something like I could, could come along. Maybe this thing is sitting on the ground. I come here, I want to pick it up. Well, I have to lift it with a force that's at least equal to mg. I want to bring it up very slowly up to this final point, so I'm going to apply an external force uh, equal to mg, or mg plus an epsilon, just to get it to move up to here. And that's what we call the work done by uh, an external force. In a sense, I'm putting my energy into this thing by doing work, lifting it up, and then uh, we'll release it from the, with the form of potential energy. So work is force times distance. Uh, that external force, that external force has to be mg times distance. And then that's going to be the change in potential energy. Uh, very often we would want to do problems with energy so we can get initial energies equal to the final en energy. Uh, so that's where it's handy to think of uh, one of these points, if it's a change in potential, as being like your zero point. And we made that typically, uh, we could make it anywhere we learned, but we could make it at the ground and just say that's gravitational potential energy zero. So we measure everything from the ground up to H. And uh, the, change in, the change in potential energy with that would be just mgh minus that original energy, which is zero. That's the change. And so what we did is we'd say the po gravitational potential energy is just mgh. And we could just use this instead of these two terms uh, to keep track of things. But we always had the explicit underst understanding that we had some position that we call potential energy zero. And again, it was kind of natural we did it uh, on the ground. Um, now we're going to do something similar with gravitation, uh, universal gravitation. We have something, this could be like the Earth or something. And we're going to take something and uh, we're going to lift it to another, another point. Uh, I'm not going to start right at the surface, although I could. Uh, the, uh, this is going to determine what the force of gravity is. Uh, but I'm going to take this thing with some external force. Imagine I'm going to lift this thing. I'm going to keep lifting. I'm going to be doing work and raising it up to some point. And we can get the work done here. And that should be equal to the change in the potential energy as I go from R initial from here out to R final. These R's have to be measured <coughs> from, from the center here. Uh, and watch, watch this. Uh, Okay, so now the work is going to be the integral. We can't just say, oh, it's just force times distance. That's good as long as the force is constant. But here the force is varying, so we're going to have to integrate that force dot dr, and that will be equal to our change in potential energy. Um, uh, U sub g, uh, putting this in, the, uh, this uh, force of gravity, which I have to apply an opposite force to do this. Uh, that's a big G M M all over R squared. So that's just this. Uh, I, it might be easiest to see the calculus. This is going to be R to the minus 2. So when we integrate it, that R to the minus 2 becomes a minus 1 over R 
well, r to the minus 1, which is going to put it down here. So hopefully you can see that with your knowledge of your calculus, why that would work. Um, and so this would describe the work that's done in taking it out to uh, this point out here. Ultimately, we always deal with just changes in gravitational potential energy between two points. This one is from between this point and this point out here, or this point and this point. Then, uh, something we suggest here, that you look at this, I have a big G MMM over R final, minus another minus big G MMM all over R initial, so I've got these two. What we're going to do is something similar to setting this one of these equal to zero. We're going to, uh, this, this part gives people trouble, that we're going to define the three uh, uh, equals here. Equals is defined to be the potential, gravitational potential energy, a bit like MGH, but it's going to be minus big G MM all over R, not R squared. If we do this, then we can use this as just our single expression, and we can do a, a final minus initial. You'll notice these have the same mathematical form as this, so all I need to do is take this at, at our final and take the same expression at our initial, and I've got an expression for what we would call the gravitational potential energy, uh, both initial and final. Now, you, you want to be careful, and it's very important that you have this idea. Uh, we were able back here to define our zero wherever we wanted to, and the typical thing is put it on the ground. Uh, students will say, well, where should we put zero here? Well, we're kind of locked in by the formalism. We are going to define it this way, but do I say that it's zero at the surface? Do I do that? Is that permissible? Uh, zero is like zero at the center, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. What about actually? We uh, well, this will tell us a lot. Okay, is it zero at the center? What happens when R goes to zero? Uh, infinite. Ooh, okay. Okay, now they, we can get around some of those paradoxes as we go in, but but we will clearly let's just say okay, we're undefined here. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Does the small m indicate the mass of the, the little block, or? Yeah. That is, yes. Good point. I apologize for that. Yeah. This is big M. This will be the planet, or let's say the Earth, and small m represents this this block. It looks like. Okay. So that that is the small m. This is the the big M. Okay. Now. We want to look at this in terms of mathematical form. How about if uh, R approaches infinity? Energy goes to zero. Yeah. So this is the most convenient mathematical form. There's no convenient way to do it like we did here. Say, I'll call this zero, and somebody else says, no, I'm going to call this zero. Uh, you want to be careful. You better play this game if you're going to be using these rules, or you will be in trouble. So uh, this idea that uh, u sub g is equal to zero at r equal to infinity, and the potential energy, uh, zero potential, is at, at infinity. Okay? So we have to do that. That's where zero is. Now the rest of these, this minus sign indicates it just keeps going negative. So when you clear out at infinity, uh, that's zero. And then as we come in, the potential energy is actually dropping uh, as, it, as it comes down. And, but it's always going in the negative sense. By dropping, it gets larger. As, as R gets smaller, this gets bigger, but in the negative sense. <laughs> so it is always down, something falling, the potential energy is going to be dropping the whole way. So it's the same as here. I say down is, it's going to be dropping in potential. Up here it's higher in potential and drops. Really it's uh, higher in that it's less negative. <laughs> and down here it's 
uh, higher and more negative. I'm not saying that well. Uh, okay, hope, hope, uh, maybe some examples will help uh, cement this idea. But this is, this is a stubborn one that you want to get, uh, get past. Okay, <clears throat> now there's some ideas. Uh, an important one is this idea of escape velocity. So if we just have something, let's say you're standing on the earth, let's say, and then I've got this small m, but let's say it's just a ball, and I want this thing to escape the earth. Okay, so I can take this thing and I can throw it up in the air. It's going to go up, and as it goes up, gravity slows it, and it gets the highest point, and then what happens? It starts to fall back, right? Uh, so if I throw it harder yet, it goes up, goes up a little higher, drops off. Now the question is, is there a velocity I could throw this thing at such that it would keep going? It would go all the way out to infinity. That's what we mean by escape. So it gets all the way out there and uh, it would be slowing down the whole way, but it would not stop until it got out to infinity where the z uh, velocity is zero. Uh, we would say the final energy there is going to be the kinetic plus the potential. The final kinetic energy has got to be zero uh, if it's going to just come to rest. And then uh, the gravitational potential is going to be zero out at infinity. So keep, keep that in mind. That means that the total energy out here would be zero. Zero kinetic, zero potential and it would be out here. Now, it would take, as it goes down, uh, throwing this ball up, it would continue to go up, and as it goes up, it goes slower and slower, and eventually, how long is it gonna take to get to an infin infinite distance? Infinite time. infinite time. And then it's gonna fall back, and that's gonna take an infinite amount of time. So basically, we could say, that's what we mean to escape, it's gonna leave, and it's not coming back. Okay? So let's uh, look at the math on that a little bit. Let's say we've got the surface here. I've got uh, kind of this picture here. I'm going to take off with uh, what I want to be the escape velocity. I, I need to solve for that. It's taking off from, let's say, the surface of the Earth. Uh, the initial energy, it's got some potential energy because it's not out at infinity. Uh, it's sitting here. It's got some kinetic energy one-half V uh, mv squared, and that V is going to be what I hope to be the escape velocity. Uh, the potential energy here is going to be a minus gmm all over the radius of the Earth, since it's taking off from the surface of the Earth. Uh, then we can say conservation of energy. E initial is equal to E final. Uh, but what's E final? And this is important to pick up from this. E final, if we want to escape, would be equal to zero. So if I set E final equal to zero and take all this for E initial, set that in here, I can then solve for uh, the escape velocity. It's minus, I take this over the other side as positive. Uh, we're going to multiply by two, take the square root, and we've got an expression for the escape velocity for a single object leaving uh, the surface of the Earth or some planet would be just that mass of the uh, planet times over the radius of that planet. Uh, so that's the idea of escape velocity for one thing. But now, don't just say, oh, I'm going to memorize this equation that'll take care of me. Because it's more important that you have these ideas, and this is where he's going to be probing. If, uh, oh, uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to escape here, but let's, let's talk a little bit first about the total energy of a circular orbit. Uh, earlier we looked at a circular orbit in terms of the forces and the velocities and the periods going around. Now let's take a look at it from the point of view of energy. Uh, the idea that we've got the force of gravity pulling in, we do have to have some velocity and hence some kinetic energy. And uh, we did this earlier, and I'm just doing it again. This is these basic 
build building blocks get used all the time. We've got this is the force of gravity, and that's equal to ma. A for a circular orbit is v squared over r. One of these r's will cancel. I could also cancel the m. I did that earlier, but I haven't. Ooh, mv squared. That's real close to kinetic, kinetic energy. In fact, if I could just stick a one half in front of that, I've got the kinetic energy. So I'll t stick a one half here, and I have to also stick a one half on the other side. Got this. Now this is what I would call my kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is equal to one half gmm over r. Notice there's no negative sign there. It does have this one half out there. This is uh, kind of concerning for a lot of people in that they look at this and they, they, they see this and say, wow, that looks like a potential energy. Why is this, why are we talking about kinetic energy like a potential energy? Uh, the idea is we're still one half mv squared is true, but with these relationships, the kinetic energy can also be uh, related to one half of this. Now, what if we want to do the uh, total energy? That's total energy is kinetic plus potential. The kinetic energy I'm, I'm putting in is this one half gmm over r. The potential energy was a minus that stuff. So you can see the confusion here. It's looking like we've got one thing. Uh, really, I've got a one half here and, uh, and uh, a minus one here. Let me factor those out. So I've got a one half minus one times big G M M all over that. And this is what we'll come up with. Uh, one half minus one is a minus one half. We'll have an expression this, and this expression, you know, get it down here, is the total energy. And this is only good for a, really a circular orbit. I should uh, clarify that. It actually is also true for an elliptical orbit if A, the semi major axis, is used instead of R. Um, let's focus on just the circular orbit. But What's, so you want to get used to be able, being able to use this, see where it comes from, and realize that this minus, it looks like this is just potential ener energy. This has kinetic energy, potential energy, all rolled into one thing. And uh, this is this total energy for, again, this is for a circular orbit. Uh, that would be something, you know, traveling in a circular orbit. Uh, okay, again, without uh, any kind of proof, uh, this is not a trivial, <laughs> trivial proof, but the result is actually pretty simple. Uh, it is just the semi-major axis for an elliptical orbit. And uh, again, this is not given uh, totally without proof. It's just asserted. Um, okay, uh, here's uh, an exam question. Uh, how much energy is needed to lift a 1,500 kilogram spacecraft straight up from the Earth's uh, surface to an altitude of two times the Earth's radius? Okay, and he gives the radius, uh, mass of the Earth, and its radius. Um, okay, again, watch the language. The idea of an altitude two times the Earth's radius is measured up from the surface, if he says altitude. one two of these and we originally have the radius of the earth back here so be careful that up here we are actually three times the radius di uh, distance to the center okay so uh, uh, we want to get how much energy is just to lift it straight up there so we would lift it up uh, this isn't the best way to put something in orbit which we'll do in a second here but just lifting it straight off the earth's surface lifting it up uh, we would have a change in potential ener energy it would be final minus initial okay so um, and that we, both of them is going to have big G mass of the earth uh, m sub s mass of the satellite that we're putting up and then this first term is going to be a minus uh, I am potential energy so it's a minus one over three times the earth's radius that's going to be the final okay one two three of these is my distance uh, and then 
uh, minus uh, the initial, or minus a minus becomes a plus, one over the radius of the Earth. That is really the initial position where we're going to take off from. And so it's the difference of these two is the change in the potential energy. Uh, again, you can kind of see the math. I'm going to have a minus one-third and a one. That's going to leave me with a two-thirds. And this is going to be the change in the potential energy from that point to that point. Uh, we can go ahead and stick in the numbers. We know G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th. Uh, mass of the Earth, uh, mass of the satellite, and we've got the radius of the Earth. So this is the change in the potential energy. Uh, this is how much energy is needed to lift that. So that would be the work it would take me to, if I were to go in there and try to just lift it straight up, uh, that would be the result. And so that's just really part A on the problem. He's going to add some little twist to it. Uh, part B, how much additional energy must be given to the spacecraft from part A to put it in a circular orbit of an altitude of two times the Earth's radius? So we're going to uh, just set this thing into, uh, into orbit. Okay. Uh, we've, in a sense, already lifted it up, and now we're going to send it around. Uh, what, what additional energy do I need? And... Uh, here, let's, uh, a number of ways we could, could approach this. Let, let's kind of go back to kind of first principles that uh, if, we're, if we're out here, the force of gravity is BJMM, and this distance is not the radius of the Earth, it's three times the radius of the Earth out to here. Um, that force should be equal to MA. Uh, the A is V squared over R, but this R here, again, is 1, 2, 3 times the radius out to here. So that's the actual radius, so don't uh, get confused by that. Um, we can then, uh, I've got this, oh, and I've got this, here's where I've got this, um, I've got some things that are going to cancel. I'm going to have the threes are going to go out, uh, radius of the of the Earth is going to be able to go out, at least with one of those, and uh, I'm left with an mv squared. I can turn that into kinetic energy by multiplying by a one-half. Okay, so this is my kinetic, and I now have, when I do that, I'm going to have a six down here. Anyway, take a look at the math. I'm uh, going to have trouble speaking all this stuff. This is the uh, kinetic energy that we need to send it into a circular orbit. And this is not the total energy. In a sense, we've done this thing in two parts. We got the potential energy up to here, and, then it, and that's the work we had to do to lift it up there, and then we put this thing into orbit. So this isn't typically the way it's done, obviously. Uh, and more, more likely, you're going to take off from the Earth's surface, and you're going to start to bend around and start to join up smoothly with this orbit uh, and you're undergoing changes in potential and uh, kinetic energy throughout that path but uh, for this problem we need this amount of kinetic energy in order to send it and put it into orbit um, that kinetic energy uh, the the answer that we get and this is for part B uh, that is the additional energy that must be given. We need to give it kinetic energy of this amount, 1.57 times 10 to the 10th joules. Okay, now let's do is step three. Uh, okay, part C. Okay, now how much uh, how much minimum additional energy would be needed to blast off from this orbit and escape the solar system. So we're talking about escape again. Uh, he gives you the sun mass and the earth to sun distance. Okay, now there's a lot of ways we could kind of arrange this, but uh, th the best way to give the minimum additional energy would be that one, the Earth is going to be orbiting the Sun, uh, the satellite is going to be orbiting the Earth, 
and we want to give uh, some additional energy. Now what we want to do is build up the kinetic energy so we can take off and hopefully get out to infinity. Uh, we want to do this at really at when these are together, when the Earth is moving like this, and then really we want to blast off really when this is at this point in the orbit because we're in the same direction. And so the, the velocity that this thing has is really the velocity of the Earth plus the velocity of the, or the orbital speed around the Earth. And so it's going to be traveling much faster and will be easier to uh, escape from the uh, from the solar system so let's uh, uh, take a look at this velocity to, uh, of the spacecraft relative to the earth uh, just in the this comes from the previous problem part B this was our result from part B and this was the energy that we needed uh, we can solve for the velocity that we would have uh, velocity of the spacecraft relative to the Earth. So that is this small v as this is going around. We also need the velocity of the Earth itself going around since uh, the Earth is dragging the satellite, uh, satellite along. Uh, the velocity of the Earth is the, the distance divided by the time. The distance around the circular path is going to be 2 pi times uh, r. So that's the circumference of that circle divided by the time. Uh, of course, the Earth goes around once every 365 days, 24 hours in a day, 3,600 seconds in an hour. And so we come up with the velocity of the Earth. So that's uh, 2.99 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. You compare these two. This was, uh, uh, this is 10 to the third. So this is almost 10 times faster than the velocity of the satellite itself. Okay, so let's uh, focus on the problem. Uh, we'll have our maximum kinetic energy is when they're going to be pointing in the same direction. So we're going to have a one-half m. The v squared is going to be these two different velocities added together and from that we're going to square that. So we've got a lot of kinetic energy. We've got that already. But now he wants to know what additional energy we could give it so that we would not we would be able to take off and escape the solar system. Uh, so uh, the, what is the total energy? This is going to be the total energy of this thing. It's going to have some kinetic energy, but it also has some potential energy due to the sun. Okay, the satellite feels that is also some potential energy due to the Earth. So we've got two of these. Uh, this is similar to, uh, if you did the homework problem, Jupiter and Ganymede. Uh, this kind of how do we escape, we've got to be very careful. Don't just plug in the first equation that you see. Uh, take this idea. So we've got, again, the total energy is the kinetic energy, potential. We've got two potentials because we've got the Earth as well as the Sun. Okay, uh, okay, so then it's a matter of number crunch time. The kinetic energy we determined up here was 8.91 times 10 to the minus 11th. The potential energy of the sun is minus big G uh, times the mass of the sun times the mass of the satellite. Okay, we're getting the potential energy of the satellite due to the sun. Uh, or did I have that back? Yeah. This is, so the, yeah, this is for the sun. Uh, all over the distance from the sun to the satellite. Well, uh, this is the Earth-Sun distance. Excuse me, wait a minute, what's that? Oh, uh, excuse me. This is the main distance between the sun and the center of the Earth. Uh, we also have a little bit of distance due to how far it is from the Earth. It, remember, it was 3r away, 3 times the radius, and so that is that distance. And so that is literally then, these two things is the distance between the sun and that satellite. 3r this way plus this distance to the sun. Uh, then we have the potential energy due to the Earth. Um, again, that's minus big G. Uh, 
the, the product of the mass is the mass of the Earth times the mass of the satellite. Uh, it's over 3R again. This is we're out at three times the this radius, uh, three times that, and we have that. We can go ahead and add up. This represents the total energy of this thing, and it sits there at a negative. <laughs> 4.67. Okay, it's, don't be bothered again by these negatives. It's just uh, uh, it's below the potential out at infinity. Um, we need to. What do we need to do if we? What additional energy? What we? What, how much minimum additional energy would be needed to blast off from this orbit and escape the solar system. So again, we want to blast off in this way. How much energy do I need to give this thing to escape? Yeah, I need to raise the total energy to zero. So uh, to escape, we must bring the total energy up to zero. So these are kind of counterintuitive things. Uh, but so if I have this, I need to add a plus. 0.46 times 10 to the minus 11th joules. So we must add those. And uh, so that's the additional energy we have to add to get this thing to escape. So you can see how he's taking these ideas uh, and uh, kind of using them, uh, complexifying the system a little bit, and uh, seeing if you have all the basic tools to put this thing together. Um, okay tricky stuff. Oh, okay, I guess that's easy. Is there any questions from, from gravity? Uh, we maybe come up with some later. Uh, I hope the review will be, uh, will be done before three. Uh, and uh, we have the workshop still today, so we can go back there. Anybody's welcome to join us if you want to do that. Uh, we can take a look at some of the homework problems or any other problems you might have. So give it some thought on this. Okay, so this I think is probably the trickier of the two chapters. Uh, but then again, you know, you're right at the end of the term where you're trying to jam all this stuff in, trying to get it all done. And uh, it's like, oh boy, one more thing. Uh, he's got chapter 14 that he's going to also tease you with as far as uh, something on the exam. Uh, if we have. Uh, so typically we'll do things like with water and we want the pressure. This idea of the pressure is defined as the, the force over the area or if we take uh, some pressure times some area we're going to get some force. And uh, uh, a unit of pressure that we're going to use, this is an SI unit, so this is going to be an important one for us, is going to be the force in forces in Newtons. Uh, over areas which should be in square meters. And so a uh, one pascal is the unit of pressure for, that we'll be using uh, with the SI units. And so we'll be using that a lot. Okay, and uh, one atmosphere, that's uh, typically done in a lot of problems, that we have the pressure of the atmosphere. We call that one ATM, atmosphere. And uh, Doing uh, this, uh, it's going to turn out that that atmospheric pressure is going to be 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. So this is just something you want to get ready to use in some problems. And uh, in this case, let's uh, let's uh, let's say that we've got some water here, and I've got kind of an imaginary cutout or slice of the water. This could be like the ocean, and it could extend out beyond this and uh, or maybe some large swimming pool might be maybe appropriate. I've got this bottom of this uh, pool here uh, sectioned off with width and length and then it's under some height of water and if we want to get the pressure of that water pointing down uh, we can look at the the force on the bottom of this thing. It's going to be equal to the weight of the water that's up on top but it's also going to depend on the force uh, up on top, which can be atmospheric pressure, can also be pushing down on the water. So uh, in terms of, again, pressure is uh, pressure times area is force. So we can say whatever that pressure is, I don't know what it is right now, we'll solve for that, but that pressure times the area of the bottom should be the force that's on the bottom. 
Uh, so we take W times L. Uh, that's the area times P. That's the force on the bottom. Uh, we're going to have the weight of the water. That's going to be the density of water times the volume. So I've got the volume is going to be W times L. Now times H is going to be the whole volume. So the density times that volume times G would be the weight of the water. Now something we're going to need to do a lot is uh, with pressures of water is to, uh, I, I think it's a, a good one to just kind of keep in mind anyway, uh, the idea of a liter of water, a liter is a 10 centimeter cube, 10 centimeters on the side, and uh, the idea of this is uh, the original definition of a kilogram was that a liter of water, so when you pick up a liter, that's one kilogram. And so uh, that forms the definition. So uh, how about if I have a cubic meter? So that cubic meter, we've got 10 centimeters. I'm going to have 10 of these things across. They're also going to be stacked 10 high. And they're going to be stacked 10 deep. So 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. I'm going to have 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. So this is a, uh, it's a good to kind of get a mental image of that uh, because these conversions get used a great deal in problems. And so you want to be ready for any of these tricky units, um, whether it's in, in liters or cubic meters. So if one liter has, is a kilogram, how many for a cubic meter? Again, 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1,000 kilograms. So, he probably would tell you this, but we're going to go ahead and use uh, that the density is going to be 1,000 kilograms. Okay, I've got some more problems where we'll, we'll make use of this. Let's just kind of do it in the abstract sense here where I won't stick in numbers. But this would be, the, again, the density. The density goes all the way back to chapter 1. Uh, the density of this is going to be the density times the volume is going to be the mass and mg is going to be the weight. Okay, plus though we could have the atmospheric pressure. I have P naught representing the atmospheric push pressure pushing down on this. That pressure times WL is also a force that's, that's down. So uh, uh, this is going to be the force on the bottom. All of these I guess are, are going to be pointing down so I, I don't uh, have any, any negative signs for that. But, um, you can see that the WLs are all going to cancel and that's going to leave you with just a simple expression that you want to get comfortable with is that the pressure here is going to be rho G and H. That would be the pressure down at some depth here uh, plus any atmospheric pressure. Now in some problems they deal with just the pressure of the, of the water itself and they could sort of say oh well this is true but we just won't deal with this. We'll just take a look at this. This is the pressure due to the water. Uh, this pressure is pushing in all directions. I've got it kind of laid out uh, relatively easy here where you can see this is, is going to be a downward force and the weight on that is going to be pushing straight down. Uh, pressure is really pointing in all directions with the fluid. So if you've got let's say a cube in there they could be pointing this way or even down from the side all possible directions these pressures kind of point. Okay, how about uh, a, a relatively simple problem is the force on a dam. The idea is, uh, uh, okay, um, let's take a look at this. Uh, the book does this as an example. I'm just going to kind of take you through it rather quickly. You can take a look. This illustration just comes out of there. Uh, we, we can get a little a differential amount of force. And I wanted to show you how we would maybe integrate this. We've got the face of the dam and we've got the water pressure is pushing out, pushing in all directions, not only down but out on the side. And it depends where we're at. Here we're H below the top of that. So there's going to be some, some pressure of this pointing out. Uh, the actual force out on the dam would be the pressure times the area. Now 
Uh, I'm going to do this in kind of differential form. Then I, we're going to imagine taking this face of the day, dam and slicing it up into a bunch of strips. And each strip is dy wide, or uh, uh, tall, I should say. It's still got the same width w across here. Uh, so the a little bit of force, differential, DF, is a small little force, is equal to that pressure times a small little area. Uh, that pressure is going to be rho GH. I'm leaving out the atmospheric part of this. Uh, times the area is going to be W times DY. That's going to be the area of that strip. And so that would be just the force here. If I want to get the total force on the dam, uh, I'm going to want to do some integration. Uh, different, we, we could work down, but I think it's probably easiest in terms of following this thing to work up. Where uh, we've got some variable, let's say y would be the height above the bottom to where the strip is we, we want. And uh, this is dy. Uh, there's going to be, uh, this is h. Again, this is y, so this is y. Uh, y plus h should be big H, the total height. Small h would be this variable. How deep are you going on this face? Then, uh, yeah, let's just kind of look at the details. Uh, uh, rho gh times w dy. Um, the h, again, is capital H minus y. I want a single in integration variable. I've got that in terms of y. And this h is a function of y, so I want to make sure to do the calculus, I want to integrate, I need to take that h, would be capital H minus y. And uh, I can integrate this thing, I want to do it across the whole face, and so I'm going to start off at zero up to a height h. And I think you can kind of see how things are going to work out here. We can factor a bunch of these constants out, we're going to integrate this. Uh, integrating this, h, this is y. Well, you, you know your calculus. I, I trust you do, or you're going to be in trouble if you don't. Um, I'll go ahead and put that in here. We integrate this. This becomes a y squared, one half y squared, and this is just a h times y. And we can go ahead and solve for the force that's on the dam. Got this, uh, got h squared minus a one half h, and do one final step. This would be the force on the walls of the dam. So this is kind of a classic problem um, uh, in, in, in your reading. Yes? Why did you get this H minus Y? Oh, H minus Y. I, I need to, I'm going to be integrating with respect to Y. So I need to put all my variables in terms of Y. So I have H, uh, and H would be big H minus this distance which was y. Yeah, you see that? Okay, so h, small h is equal to big H minus y. And so that's where that came in. Okay, a little tricky, but uh, once, you, once you see it, I think you'll be more comfortable with it. Um, maybe not too obvious that he would maybe do something like that. That's, uh, that kind of problem is something that I would think uh, it's potential he could ask. More likely, he's going to want to hit this idea of Archimedes principle. And Archimedes principle is, talks about this idea of a buoyant force. Um, you know that if you even take a, a rock and you in the water, you can pick up a really pretty heavy rock in the water. Try to take it out of the water, you start to feel what its real weight is. There is this idea of a buoyant force. Now, imagine you've got a bunch of water, and uh, I'm going to end up sticking a stone in here to get the buoyant force. But imagine before I stick it in here, I'm going to take kind of its outline here and say, hey, I've got a bunch of water here. It's in equilibrium. It's just hanging there. So what about the net force on it? It has to be zero. So even though this, this could have a complicated shape, uh, these pressures, I do expect this is, this is deeper than the top here. So these forces are going to be greater, and they're going to be pushing on that surface. Uh, they're going to weaken a little bit as they go up the sides. They're going to be a lot weaker up here where the, the force is uh, closer to the surface, uh, lower pressure. 
And so we're going to have all of these forces here. And we can say that this thing is in, in equilibrium, that all of these forces together, we're going to say, uh, will add up to what we'll just call one force, that is the buoyant force. And uh, it, since this is in equilibrium, that buoyant force has to equal the weight of the fluid. Uh, it might be water, it could be any kind of fluid. So we've got that idea. Then if I want to, what I, we say, displace this fluid, take this fluid and somehow take it out of there, or take and put a stone there, put a stone there, uh, the idea that these forces that are on the outside are still the same forces there were for the water, the, but these forces are now acting on the stone. So even though we know stones are going to sink, uh, the buoyant force is still acting, and that buoyant force would have these same forces acting on it. It has to be the same as it was for the, the fluid. So we say the buoyant force, upward force, is going to be equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Buoyant force is equal to the weight of the dis displaced fluid. Okay, so let's say we're going to uh, do a couple problems. Uh, Okay, we have a spherical shell of, of aluminum with a mass of uh, 1.26 kilograms. It has an inner radius of R1 and an outer radius R2. Oh, they say it barely floats in the water. So I take that to mean that it is in the, in the water, that sphere, and it's right, it could be sitting right at the top of it, but it is all underneath the, the water, or in the water. What are the dimensions of R1 and R2? Uh, okay, and just given, given that information. He does give you the density of aluminum. Uh, we're also going to need the density of water, which we just talked about as being 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this density is greater than that, so if this, uh, but this ball is floating. The only way that's going to happen, let's see if I can get a graphic here, is if it's kind of hollowed out. The idea that we have this aluminum here that's here, and if we got it hollowed out here with a, with a radius R1, we just have the, our material here. Uh, this would be a vacuum in here, or maybe we could let a little air in there. It wouldn't change things too much. But consider that there's nothing on the inside here. It's all based on this shell of, of aluminum. Now, uh, as far as, since it's, it's being held there, we could say the, the buoyant force would be this buoyant force wanting to lift it up. Uh, minus the weight of that, that should be equal to zero. Since it's just poised there, it's not moving up or down, but it is completely submerged. So the buoyant force is equal to the total weight of the water that's displaced. So we, we can do that mathematically, the density of water, times, <clears throat> this is only using R2, since that uh, doesn't know anything, uh, the outside doesn't really know what R1 is saying, uh, but that uh, volume here, 4 thirds pi R cubed, this is R2, so that's the whole radius of the whole thing, uh, is equal to, uh, that buoyant force has got to be equal to mg. Uh, mg is the weight of this thing. Uh, the buoyant force was the weight of the displaced water. So let's look at that. This is the kind of new part. We take the density of water times the volume. Uh, that's going to be the mass. And the weight of the water would be times g. So we're going to have a g on both sides that we could cancel. The density of the water is, again, that 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And we've got, again, 4 thirds pi r2 squared. And he gives us the uh, uh, mass of this, of this uh, shell uh, of aluminum, 1.26 kilograms. We've got everything that we can solve for r2. And I, I came up with 6.7 centimeters. You want to watch your units here carefully. But uh, it's, it's not a difficult calculation to make. So once we have R2, then we can also, the fact that this whole thing can only weigh 1.26 kilograms, it's not totally filled. Uh, it's got this hollowed out space. Uh, but we could say that uh, its, its mass should be equal to the density of that aluminum 
times the volume, the volume of just the aluminum. So I've got really uh, four thirds pi r2 cubed. That's going to be the whole volume of the whole the whole thing minus this hollowed out hole minus that'll be four thirds pi r1 cubed. Just factoring out the four thirds pi. We've got that. Uh, and this all has to be true. Once I have R2, now it's a simple way of getting at R1. The calculations aren't, aren't really difficult. R1 is uh, 5.74 centimeters. Okay, so that would be an, an example. These are real typical of what I might expect or you should expect to get. Uh, let's do another one. It doesn't hurt to do a few of these. Uh, just wood floating in water. Okay, a wooden cube with 15 centimeter sides floats in the water with 45% of the wooden block above the water line. And uh, I just lost my place here. 45% of the wooden block above the water line. And uh, he wants to know what volume of lead can be added on top of this wooden cube without sinking the wood cube system. Right now it's sticking up a bit. So the idea is we'll put a, a chunk of lead on top of there. It should push it down. When I first uh, saw this problem, I thought, well, the top of this thing should lie with here and that this lead should be sitting up on top. Uh, he had meant with his solution uh, to be, well, first of all, is 45 uh, let me let me come back to this issue. Let's let's do a little bit here first with this wood block. Here, let, let me just throw this up here. We don't have to do this in any particular orbit order. This is what he has in mind that we want to put this lead block on top and it's going to weight this thing down and now the two of these things are going to be s supported right below the water line. They're just barely floating so they're in equilibrium <coughs> and uh, there's going to be the buoyant force is going to do to the displaced fluid here as well as the displaced fluid or water here. We'd have to add those two together. They kind of have separate little buoyant forces or we could combine them in one buoyant force that's up. Okay, let, let's go back to this idea. He did tell us something about this wooden cube because I don't know too much about it. It's 15 centimeters on the side. Uh, it does float in water with 45% of the wooden block above the water line. So it kind of looks like this originally until we add the wood block. So uh, it's in equilibrium. It should be the, some of the forces would be the upward buoyant force. Gravity's pulling down. That should all be in equilibrium is zero. Uh, the buoyant force should be the density of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And I, I could multiply this out for the volume. I just called it the volume is going to be 0.55. That's 55% of the volume. So we've got density times the volume is the mass times G. That's going to uh, be the, uh, the buoyant force upward. And then we have uh, the, the wood itself. We need to have the weight of that. Well, I don't know what the density of wood is. Uh, I, I can infer it from this, however. The density of the wood is going to be the volume. The wood takes up the whole volume of the cube. That's 15 centimeters on the side. I just call it the volume. And that is going to be its weight, mg. And uh, we can cancel the g's. The volumes cancel. And I can come up with the, that the density of the wood is going to be 550 kilograms per cubic meter. Again, compare that to water, 1,000 kilograms. Uh, this is less, and so it's less dense, and that's one reason it floats like this, floats on top. But I need the density for the next part of this. We're going to say, okay, now we're going to put this lead block. It's going to push this thing down, and also it's going to submerge right to the top of this lead, lead cube. And now let's look at the forces that are acting on it. <clears throat> We've got uh, the, the wood block itself, this density of 550 kilograms per cubic meter times the volume of the block, point, uh, 15 centimeters cubed. 
going to be that. Uh, this weight is going to be down. Of course, it's that mass times g. Then the buoyant force is going to be uh, up. Oh, excuse me. I also have the weight of the of the lead here. The lead density is 11,000 kilograms per cubic meter. This is the weight of the lead. So I've got the weight of the wood. This is the weight of the lead, the density times the volume of the lead. Of course, I don't know what that is. I've got a, that is, in fact, that's the question. What, what is the volume of that lead? Uh, we'll see if we can solve for that. And then uh, those weights are down. The density, or excuse me, the buoyant force is up. 1,000 times 0.15 cubed. Uh, would be the, uh, this is the volume of the wood block plus the volume of the lead, which I don't know yet, uh, times the density of the water, since we're getting the buoyant force, that's 1,000, and put that in. Uh, we can, and set that all equal to zero, since it's in equilibrium. Uh, the G's cancel nicely, and... Uh, then we're going to really, we need to, I've got my unknown here. The volume of the lead and the volume of the lead over here. I need both of these. I need to do a little algebra and it's not, not difficult, uh, but I came up with the volume of that lead is 1.47 times 10 to the minus fourth. That's in cubic meters. If we want to put it in something like uh, centimeters, I worked that out and you should be able to verify this. A cube with that size of 5.2 centimeters would be needed to do that. So uh, that is what he's asking for. What volume of lead can be added to the top of the wooden block without sinking the wood lead system? Okay, trickies. Uh, Okay, so there was a couple problems like that. Again, you want to probably look at some of the homework related to that. It'd be real typical of a test question. Uh, another thing he likes, and right at the end here, just one more thing, is uh, Bernoulli's equation. The idea uh, has some neat ideas. Uh, it is actually very specialized, and uh, uh, it's, it not, doesn't pertain too much to the real world. Uh, it is uh, for the idea of streamlines. It's for non-turbulent flow. Uh, it's really only valid for incompressible fluids. Uh, we'll look at that in a moment. But the idea that the water could be coming in, it could come in with some speed, and it could go out with some different speed, uh, uh, and it could be going up in that it's raising its potential energy. Um, uh, as, as well as changing its uh, cross-sectional area. Um, anyway, let's take a look at this in a little greater detail. Okay. Uh, with Bernoulli's equations, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, we also have the idea of uh, uh, that these are for incompressible fluids. This is the only way this is going to really work out. Uh, Bernoulli's equation often gets used with air and gases, those are only approximately correct. Uh, but for an incompressible fluid, which most fluids is pretty reasonable, if you've got something like water, it's very difficult to compress it. Whereas as air, you know, you think of like a balloon, I could squeeze it down, I can very much compress, compress air. Uh, the idea that as it moves through this streamline tube, uh, it can get changed in uh, its velocity and direction, but uh, we will not have any turbulent flow in there, as you'll see from our energy principles. Uh, the volume that's coming in, we can bring in a little bit of water here, and let's say this volume, and we're going to send it out. We, since we don't compress it, it has to go out with that same volume. So if you look at the volume here, that's going to be the cross-sectional area, call that A1, times uh, the amount we're going to move it. You can imagine I've got a syringe on there. I'm going to extrude it through here, and it's going to come out over here. Uh, there's going to be A2 times X2 would be this distance. And this with a bigger radius here or area, this is going to be smaller, the delta 
delta x is going to be smaller than delta x1 here. That these, but these two volumes have to be the same. So this is an important uh, idea that you have. We're going to develop <coughs> uh, uh, Bernoulli's equation here in a moment, but very often that is always used in conjunction with this principle. And so don't just memorize Bernoulli's equation. You need to be able to do this. So this is, uh, again, we're going to bring a certain amount in. That same amount's going to go out. That's going to be their volume. We can also look at, this is going to happen in the same amount of time. So I would say the time that I shot this out is going to be the same time that that went out. The delta t's will be the same. So if I just take this expression, divide by delta t, uh, and then delta x1 over t is going to be the velocity here, v1, and uh, delta, uh, delta x2 over t is going to be v2 times that area, and these are going to be the same because the volumes are the same. This is going to be important in terms of relating uh, velocities, as you'll see, I've got a, an example for this. Okay, uh, it's all based on energy. The idea, we're going to do some work on this. Uh, the idea that this pressure, pressure times the area, is a force. That force times that distance, delta x1, is going to be the work done. So that's going to tend to move the fluid a little more fast, fastly. And uh, as it comes up here, there's going to be a pressure pushing back. It's just action and reaction. This is the reaction from the fluid on this side pushing back. Uh, that pressure times that area is a force times the distance that we move is delta x2 is going to be the uh, is going to be the work done. So work done is is positive this force or pressure on this side pressure times the area times the distance minus this other one pressure pushing wanting to get the flow to come back this way is going to be times area 2 times delta x2 and all that work done in the work energy principle would be then equal to both our change in kinetic and our change in potential energy. Uh, now, if we take uh, these uh, work done, we've got that. Now, the idea of the gravitational potential energy, I've got M times the volume, A2 times delta X is the volume, times the density is the mass, times G, times the height, which is Y2, so that is the potential energy up here. Uh, and then uh, I've got down here, I've got uh, minus the potential energy on this side, this is a delta U I want, plus minus this. So it's going to be that density times the volume, which is A1 times delta X1. That uh, density times the volume is the mass times G, and the H is Y1. Uh, so that all of that is the potential energy. The kinetic energy is one half m. The mass of these individual things are going to be the density times the volume. So uh, a two times x two uh, is is going to be uh, the the volume times the density is the mass. We know the kinetic energy is one half m v squared. We do that minus the uh, uh, initial kinetic energy down here, that's going to be one half, and that density is going to be the density A1 times X1 times V1 squared. So all this is based on energy. Uh, a bunch of things are going to drop out here. We've got, uh, we've got this relationship here that A1, X1 is equal to A2, X2. All of those, uh, although all of those terms are going to drop out and simplify things. You can pick through this in detail if you want uh, and end up with this. We're going to then separate the initial terms or the uh, first terms on one side, second on the other, very much like we do with conservation of energy. And we end up with Bernoulli's equation. Okay. Now, hopefully you, you, know, you can at least follow through on this and you get the general drift of the argument that leads up to this. This is an energy. Uh, Normally, we deal with uh, external forces changing the 
potential energy and the kinetic energy. Consider that uh, these terms, instead of forces with, with pressures, uh, we've got, we'll use pressures instead. Uh, dense uh, potential energies, MGH, instead of M, we use the density of the material. So a little different twist. Also, one half MV squared is the kinetic energy. For, the, for what we're dealing with, it's one half rho V squared, where this is the density of the, of the material, both initially and final. So again, this is the Bernoulli's equation. Whether you follow this, you definitely need this, but you also need this. Now I've got an example for this. Uh, here's uh, here's a, a past exam question. Uh, uh, main water line pipe coming into the first floor here of the PS building is two inches or this many centimeters in diameter. The water line carries water up to the second floor four meters. Okay, assuming the water line's diameter remains constant, what is the drop in pressure between the first and second floors of the PS building? Now there's going to be more to this question. This is just like part A. Uh, so let's look at that. Uh, first off, uh, this is going to be a little bit simpler here because uh, A1 is equal to A2. They're the same diameter, right? So the areas have to be the same. Those have to go out. And that implies that as we get from the first floor up to the second floor, they're traveling the same velocity. Uh, that's going to greatly simplify if we want to use uh, Bernoulli's equation, uh, we know that the velocities are the same, so this kinetic energy term, this is V1 squared and this is V2 squared, they, but they're equal so that we can cancel them on these sides of the equation. And then uh, rearrange some terms here that uh, I'll bring the uh, P, delta P is going to be P2 minus P1, so I'll uh, uh, I'll subtract these two, and that's going to be equal to the d rho g times the difference in the height, y2 minus y1. Uh, interpreted in, in this uh, problem, we've got uh, the density of its water, so it's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. G is still 9.8. The y2 minus y1 is the amount it went up. It went up 4 meters. So this is the difference in pressure. Now, if the problem just stopped here, we could, we could say that this is way overkill. We should have been able to say right off the bat, say, hey, the difference in pressure between two levels, four meters, has got to be just this uh, uh, density times G, rho, G, and H. So this we could have probably just written out. And had you done this on the exam, uh, you could have gotten full credit for the first part. But it's really in part two where this the power of Bernoulli's equation comes in. Okay, this is the difference in pressure there. Uh, this is uh, on, okay, over well, here it is. Being four meters above the first floor, so he's adding now, okay, if in addition to being four meters above the first floor, the pipe on the second floor is corroded so that the diameter is reduced by 30%, ooh, what is the pressure drop between the first and the second floor when the water is flowing at a speed of 11 meters per second on the second floor? Ugh. Sounds pretty nasty. But here's where we want to definitely make use of this. Uh, we've got the areas and the, the velocities. Uh, the area at the first one was that 0.0508. Uh, that was the diameter. I divided it by 2, so we have a pi. R squared uh, would be the area times V1. A2 is uh, smaller. It's reduced. The diameter is reduced by 30%. Uh, so that means that the uh, uh, radius is also reduced by 30%. Uh, that means that there's 70% left. So what I'm going to do is uh, take 70% or 0 0.70 times the radius, that's going to be the diameter divided by 2, and we're going to take that radius, pi r squared, we're going to take that and we're going to square that for the area, that would be a2, 
and uh, of course we've got the we've got the pi there. We could cancel some things like the pi's and the twos, and we can solve for v1 because he already told us that when water is flowing at a speed of 11 meters on the second floor, that is really v2. So uh, I end up with uh, solving for v1. Uh, that's going to be 0.70. That's going to end up being squared there. Uh, they tell us what that uh, velocity is. It is 11 meters per second. And so the velocity on the first floor has got to be traveling at 5.39 meters per second. That's the relative flow rate in the pipes. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, now we can take that information in conjunction with uh, Bernoulli's equation. I just wrote down Bernoulli's equation. Uh, we're going to be dealing with some differences, so I kind of rewrote the form of it. He wants to know what the difference in pressure is between the top and the bottom. That's going to be a delta P. And then we're going to have a, a change in potential energy and a change in kinetic energy. So we're going to go ahead and put this in. Uh, delta P is equal to the density times G times the Y2 minus Y1. That's still four meters up to the second floor, so that's going to be the rise in potential energy. The kinetic energy, we've, we're going to have uh, uh, one, half, uh, whoa, one, one half rho times the difference in the squares. I, I, I did this in terms of uh, the potential energy, I mean the kinetic energy, factoring the one half rho out and then we end up with a, a difference. So we're going to have a V2 squared minus V1 squared I again put in for 1,000 for the density. V2 is 11 meters per second. That was given here in the problem. And then we need this other piece here that's going to be uh, 5.39 is V1. So we'll put that in. We'll square that. Now it's just number crunch time and I get a difference in pressure between the, the two floors of being that. Okay, so uh, this is kind of, uh, he, he likes Bernoulli's, uh, so don't count it out, okay? And I think this is a good example to do for that. Uh, wow, good luck! <laughs> okay, uh, again, we're going to be going next, next back to the room there, the lab there, if you want to join us, you, you may. And uh, good luck, good luck getting ready for your final. And finals. I know you got more than one. Yeah. Uh, one second.